Okay, so now we've, we've given you at least a basic introduction to these richness estimators, okay? And that basically means that we're one step away from completeness estimators. But that's really easy and we'll do that at the end. Um, first of all, I wanna give you a little bit of an idea about the studies that have been done over the years uh, comparing different estimators. You remember with the Soberon and Jorente paper, they used three different regression equations to estimate final fauna size or flora size. And remember that we saw in one of those examples that whichever one was B was working better than A and C, right? You remember that? So I think everybody has now moved beyond the curve fitting approaches. And you guys know why, because of those little plateaus and jumps and breaks. So really nobody is, is fitting curves anymore. And in fact, if you read the manual of Estimate S, it says that they really aren't supporting curve-based richness estimators anymore. They've left the old routines in there just in case for some reason somebody needs to replicate an old analysis. But they're not developing or supporting um, curve-fitting based estimators. So now we have a new set of estimators. And I just, I really am not going to give you the full detail of the comparative analyses for a variety of reasons. This paper certainly looked definitive, the concepts of bias, precision, and accuracy, and their use in testing the performance of species richness estimators with a literature review of estimator performance. And so when I saw this published a decade ago, I got pretty excited about it, and then I realized that it kind of doesn't have any objective analysis in it. So I was a little frustrated with that. Um, this is a paper I'll go through mainly for fun. It's a paper that I did with a, a mammologist at the University of Kansas. Um, and I'm gonna show you this because it introduces a concept or two, and also because it was fun. Um, when I was a child, we would do long trips because we lived in the center of the country and all four of my grandparents lived in the Northeast. And so it would be about a three day drive to get from Ohio to New England. And you know, that, w that happened when I was one year old, two year old, three, four, all through. And so we would always play a game. I had two older sisters and my parents and the game we would play was who could accumulate the longest list of species of license plates, okay? And so when I got into this, this set of questions about how do you decide when an inventory is complete, Obviously, the, the thing to do is to have a competition amongst these estimators and see which one performs best or see which ones perform best, okay? So the idea was, let's create a, a competition and see which one fails the least or succeeds the most. But there's a problem. If I do it with the data for Corrup National Park, I don't really know what the truth is. If we put in 200 days in Corrup National Park, I don't know what the truth will be when, I, when we put in 400 days. And so I was searching for a situation where um, I knew the truth, right? Now, I could have set up a simulation, but I'm not really good at that. And so I didn't. And instead, this is a very nice situation because there are five times 10, 50 states in the United States. So guess what? I have a fauna or flora or license plate group of 50 species. 
And there's some other interesting things about this situation. Um, I'm looking for Kansas. Anyhow, Kansas and Missouri are very common in Lawrence, Kansas. I literally can't see Kansas. Um, and for example, Alaska and Hawaii are very, very rare. Okay? And so that kind of sounds like a natural environment and counting species of birds or herbs or plants. And then I even did this sampling for two different faunas or floras or whatever they are. I did this in Lawrence, Kansas, and then I also did it in Mexico City. And in Mexico City, you have a smaller fauna size, 31 states, but we spent a few weeks driving around Mexico City. We were actually like visiting family and, and uh, going to the university and things like that. But there I was doing my daily list of license plates. Okay? And I did that in Lawrence, Kansas for a couple of months. So what we did was to develop this sort of diagram. And I need to orient you to this first. This dotted line, the, the flat dotted line in each of these diagrams, that is the truth. Okay? So for example, here, this is, this is the number of states. Here the truth is a little lower because this is Mexico and this is the US. Okay? Now, next thing we did, notice that the x-axis is number of days, the y-axis is number of species. So this is the same graph as a species accumulation curve. Okay? Dave, just here with us. This is counting species of license plates. Okay? So what we did was not to do the species accumulation curve because then you would expect that to go from low up to high, right? And it would converge on the asymptote. It can no, never go above the number of states and maybe won't even reach the number of states. But you're not seeing an accumulation curve here. What you're seeing is S sub EXP. So let's go way back. You are see, oops, sorry. You're seeing this. Okay, you're seeing the value of this species richness estimator. And you remember, we know how to calculate that. It's the number of species observed plus this number of species you haven't observed. So you're not seeing this number of species observed. You're seeing the number of species that are estimated to be in the fauna or whatever we call it when it's license plates. So, that's what this black line is, okay? That is the number of species estimated to be in the fauna. And then these fainter lines are showing you the variance around those estimates. So does everybody get what's in this graph? I'm gonna give you one example. Let's look at, um, this is a good one. Let's look at this example, United States, and it's, it's I can't even read that. Um, at, zero, at very few days, I think that's a zero, the estimators are crazy, but as we go to a few days, they are overestimating. Notice that the black line is above the dotted line, okay? And it comes down and by one day on average, it's really hit the, the uh, truth and it stays on the truth for a long time. Okay, so that's a pretty good estimator. And this example, with very few days, it was a very high overestimate and it came down and it got closer and closer to the truth, but it's still overestimating. And all the way out 
to right about here, it's still consistently overestimating. So that's a pretty bad estimator. And then we can look at this one where it started out underestimating and then it crawls up to the truth, but notice that it takes until somewhere pretty far out there to get to the truth. Now what we want is an estimator that gets to the truth very quickly, right, with relatively little data. So that even if I don't know the name of each of those 50 species in my fauna, at the very least, I know that there are 50 species in my fauna. Everybody get it? Okay. So then we explored these different estimators further. And remember, we talked about precision and accuracy yesterday, right? Precision is essentially with, with what grain you're able to specify a number. And that is given by this spread. So it's essentially this distance, okay? It's the spread of the different uh, random replicates. That's spread, that's precision. And then this is bias. Bias is given by how far this curve is from the truth. Okay? So, what you can see is that, for example, this, again, it's Mexico, US, and uh, with only three days of data, with five days of data, and with 10 days of data. And, for example, with 10 days of data in the US, this method has both high spread, which is to say low precision, and high bias, low accuracy. And so this is a very bad estimator. And a very good estimator is gonna be down here. Okay? So the bad news about that study, it was fun. In fact, I was able to uh, dedicate that paper in memory of a person who had died shortly before with whom we had played the license plate game just a few months before. So it was a lot of fun, actually. The bad news is that none of those estimators is still in use very much. The Chow estimator was in there, but it didn't have the bias correction. So really, that paper was, is now outdated, okay? And we'll come back to the different estimators uh, when we talk about uh, estimate S in the afternoon. Um, the thing to remember is that if you look across the kind of comparative literature about inventory richness estimators, the Chow 2 estimator really comes out as a winner in general, and certainly a winner if you also ask it to be pretty simple. Okay? Anyhow, inventory statistics. It's a quantitative approach to understanding completeness of biotic inventories. It's a crucial element of interpreting and understanding inventory data. And it is very key in de deciding when a site is thoroughly assessed, in establishing absence of species, and in optimizing your inventory efforts. Okay? So these statistics are pretty important. If you want to publish a paper on the Herps of Corrup National Park or the plants of your study area back home, whatever, you really should be including a fairly detailed analysis using these statistics. The good news is we have some software to do that for us, okay? The bad news is that I believe quite firmly in understanding things deeply before you use them, okay? So that means you guys to get to do this by hand. There's the equation, right? This is the equation we're looking for. And if you remember, earlier in the morning, I gave you two matrices, this one and this one. Okay? And what I want you to do is to calculate inventory completeness statistics for each of these. Okay? Um, I'm gonna turn off the screen for one moment because I need to fix this matrix. 
um, just to make sure that your exercise works. I'll put it back on, and then you guys know from this equation, write this down, here's what you need, it's just three numbers. It is the number of samples, which in this case will be days, the total number in the sample, okay? That's N. <coughs> Sorry, you need four numbers, I lied to you. You need the number of species that has been recorded in our inventory as of the last day. That's S OBS, S observed. And then you need F1 and F2. And F1 is the number of species seen only once. And F2 is the number of species that has been seen twice. Okay, four numbers. Number of samples, number of species recorded actually, number of species that were seen only once, and the number of species that were seen twice, exactly. Not twice or once, not twice or three times, twice. Any questions about what you're trying to get? Which estimator are we using? This one, number two. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. This one, number four. My apologies. So forget what I said about Q1, Q, F1, F2, it's Q1, Q2. My apologies, okay? So again, here we go. Number of samples, number of species, number of species observed once, and number of species observed twice. Okay, so we just looked at our two matrices. We did some calculations. For the first matrix, the one that had a lot more ones in it, even though they both have the same accumulation curve, for the matrix that had a lot of ones in it, we were pretty sure we were done. So we had observed 16 species, and we predict that there are 16 species in that fauna or flora. But for the second matrix, where there were many more zeros than ones, <coughs> 